Hello, I'm Jonathan Weiner. I'm Enrique Gonzalez Mueller. And welcome to episode five of Are You Listening? The Mixing Series. Compression and dynamics. Compress first or EQ first? Are we looking for dynamic transparency? Or are we really trying to change the envelope of the sound? And then finally, sidechain compression. But really, why would we do this? Don't forget to subscribe to the Isotope YouTube channel to see future episodes of Are You Listening? And be reminded every time a new video comes from Isotope Incorporated. <laughs> We already covered EQ. We're going to compression. Well, should compression come before or after EQ? These are often the questions that we ask ourselves. And of course, the punchline at the end of all of these questions mm -hmm. is yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> so is that is that not so? And the other way to say it is it depends. Yes, that's the other way to say it. It depends. That's right. What is my guiding principle that I'd like for people to go try out? Similar to what we did with EQ, where I was saying fix first, sculpt later. For me, it's understanding is the bigger issue that I hear an EQ frequency footprint issue, or is it a dynamic issue? If I go and listen to this bass, If you remember, we have here in the EQ a bunch of housekeeping in the low end, right? So we have a filter that's cutting everything below 65 and adding a little bit of a bump. And the reason for that is if we take this off, you might remember that there is and the second one got a balloon of low end happened. So actually, let's go listen to just the beat and the bass without anything else so that we can go back to hearing what that low end balloons like if we turn these filters off. So this of course is now made better with these filters. If I'm thinking of applying compression, which here I have Ozone Pro at the ready, should I put the compressor before or after? Well, if I put it before, the compressor is not going to listen to the fix. So my compressor on that second note is probably gonna go crazy, but if I put obviously the compressor after the EQ, it's going to be post fix. So I put on this compressor, ratio five to one, the attack is about 50 milliseconds so that the pops can have a chance of coming out. The release is timed so that the next note can breathe a little bit. It's behaving pretty well. I'm just gonna hit play and for everybody, I want you to hear how the bass is popping out for lack of a better word, and how it's popping out on those two phrases. So here it is with the compressor after the EQ. You see here the envelope as well, how it's affecting. So now let's do the same, but I'm going to put it before the EQ. Well, what's funny is some of the notes actually disappear more, not just in terms of process, your, your, like what you do first, uh -huh. but also in terms of signal flow. And just to take the opportunity to say that the opposite might be appropriate for a different thing. You might have a dynamic issue that is then impacting how you would EQ something, right? Maybe this bass is popping super hard and you want to get that dynamic pop a little ha handled a little bit better so that you can have a better understanding of the sound not moving like this dynamically and then you EQ. Mm -hmm. So let's start with it as I would have it after the EQ. Mm -hmm. 
when the compressor is before the EQ, I just hear it going, help, I'm over here. It just, it, it doesn't have a chance. <laughs> so as I go from this macro to micro, I'm always thinking, do I really need compression or do I need to fix the amplitude of the signal itself? Mm -hmm. So here you see that every note is chopped. This is because we went to the studio, expensive studio, when recorded the bass with the hottest, whatever, whatever. And then I listened to the demo and the demo just crushed it. Hmm. The vibe was a lot better. There was kind of a nasal grit to it that I loved. So I took the demo. All the notes are, are chopped because I wanted to make things super quantized. The bass player of this band, I, I'm a fan. But we wanted this kind of hyper real, super tight sound. The thing about it, the amplitude is a bit all over the place. I grab all of these little chops and I then do amplitude editing. You see that the third note is up by 3.9, then 4.6, then 5.2. Yes, it's a lot of work. I am not trying to automate things. I'm not trying to make things be equally loud when I listen within the arrangement. I just try to fix recording shortcomings. So what's the difference between that and automation, the way you're using the word? Automation for me would be, this is the bass, so dynamics, right? Quiet, loud. This is the bass here. And there's a guitar that comes in on the chorus only. So when the guitar comes in on the chorus only, I will automate this to be louder. So it's, it's, that's more about sort of song and, and arrangement changes, if you will, yeah. as opposed to addressing the performance. Addressing the performance and any recording shortcomings or perhaps it's a performance difficulty, right? Like we were saying, da -da 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 that doesn't, you don't push as much help a little. Yep. Why? So the compressor can get better input and it has a way better fighting chance at changing the envelope as it will in a better way. So here is my no amplitude editing and here is my amplitude edited version. Let's listen without first, and when it loops, I'll pop in the playlist with the amplitude editing. The bass is just, it's talking to me. Mm -hmm. It's just forward and, it, and I can hear every note. Compression, whether you want it or not, it's going to change the shape of the envelope. So is that what I want? Or do I want the performance with its expressiveness to just be more dynamically uniform? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amplitude editing. Mm -hmm. Let's stick with the bass. Here in Neutron, I'm going to put that compressor that I would have in, in the same channel. I always think, am I going for dynamic transparency or am I really out to change the envelope of the sound? Do I want to keep the vibe and just make it just stand up and come forward a little bit more? Do I want to really change the character of mm -hmm. what's coming to me? Mm -hmm. So here for this bass, if we go look at the compressor, I've made the settings so, so that I keep the character of the bass. I have an attack at 35.8 milliseconds to let those pops sing through. I have a release that is a little bit slow. Mm -hmm. All of this here, if we go in Neutron Pro, I love that now you can have this oscilloscope view, which tells you how it's changing the shape of the envelope. So if I bypass this and you look at the waveform, So this choice where you can use compression to even out the performance. The other is this amazingly creative thing that you can do with compression, which you could think of totally separately, which is this envelope shaping thing. Yeah. But but in order to finesse the, the exact sound you're after, that kind of envelope shaping is possible and what you can do is really, really cool and really interesting. Neutron, really, this oscilloscope view 
if we see it, we understand what was it? What is it now? Oh, I'm moving this thing. So let's go and do mm -hmm. a version where here I'm going for this dynamic transparency, right? I'm trying to keep the pops. I'm trying to keep the body of it about the same. And this informs where I put the attack, the release, and the ratio. I'm going to make a copy of this, bypass the first one, and let's go for a completely different sound. So now I do want to alter the envelope and I don't want the pops to be as aggressive. I want this to be more kind of uniform, Smooth. low end pressure. Mm. So if I hit play, I already can anticipate I'm gonna have a faster attack so that those pops are brought down quicker. The release, we'll play with to see when we hear the low end, it's probably gonna be considerably faster so that it just gets out of the way and gives us that energy. Let's play with it, but all the while, look at how the envelope is changing. That little snap at the top. And we see if we make it even tighter. If we go and make the release faster, and that tail end balloons out a little bit more, And you know, when people are listening, one of the things you hear, and keeping with the other way, like how you were listening to EQ and the relational sort of thing that happens, mm -hmm. it's it's not married to the kick drum as well anymore. Uh huh. Because you have sort of pulled down that part of the character, so yeah. it's not landing at the same time. So it feels like it's separated. And also, a thing that I find is that the kick drum has a doom, doom, that before the bass was kind of scalloping after the mm of the kick drum, and now because the release is faster, it's getting in the way of the tone of the kick. I'm gonna make the ratio a little bit more exaggerated and then let's listen between the two versions. So now that we have that one, let's open this first one up as well. So the one on the left, is the first one, the one on the right is the second one. So let's start where we were and then bypass and, and switch over. It is subtle. Mm -hmm. You haven't totally destroyed the instrument. Yeah. Um, but the effect is noticeably different. I want to do the same about the, the envelope change, but on the drums. Mm. And here, let's go and, and be brutal. I have one already set up. I have two compressors, and we're going to do one where we're just trying to get a little bit of, yeah, dynamic transparency, but I also want the drums to pop a little bit more and the hi-hat to be a little bit crispier, just kind of for it to stand up and then let's go brutal and really change the envelope. So compressor number one, attack at 23, 25 milliseconds to again, let the transients go through. The release is set musically so that the next hit is not squashed, raise your four to one. So here, this is the before. Actually, let's see if we need to mute the bass or not. Let's listen. So here's about the drums. Especially that hi-hat is coming out. Right? We hear the hi-hat gets a little bit brighter, but it also feels that there's more emergency mm -hmm. to it. Now, if I'm gonna bypass this, and here I have another compressor, the attack is super fast. Mm -hmm. The release is also quite fast. The ratio two to one, not super heavy, but let's make the threshold until it's just ridiculous. Of course, because I'm turning things down so much, I'm gonna have to compensate with makeup so that we can listen to it. Mm -hmm. 
if we go and listen to the drums only, it sounds a bit radical. Mm -hmm. Drums, what's your role? It's almost like parallel processing to the samples. Mm -hmm. Where does the character in the grit, the sample is a sample. It's just a repeating, constant, never changing, always the same bit of stimulus. The drums is where the, where the imperfections are. I'm treating it as you need to bring the life to this. Mm -hmm. Yes, some of the top end as well, but the grit is coming from the drums. Mm. So for me, that I can make it this radical, I'm thinking of it as parallel compression. If, if it was drums only and I didn't have samples, then I might take an approach like bring this the mix down in here. It felt to me like the role of this track is to provide some of the subdivisions of the beat. Sort of having that more available was helping with that aspect of the texture is bringing that energy up this track to me serves as the spackle and it's like a parallel processing character to the samples Neat. if it was a drum only track i would yeah. set the mix to serve as that parallel compression side chain compression what is it first off mm -hmm. right it's you have a signal that you're wanting to compress, but instead of the compressor reacting to the sound of it, it's reacting to cues from an external source. So the right hand knows what the left hand is doing. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to keep the theme, let's go and open up our lovely bass. Let's take this one that we had done out of the way. A transient designer setup and a compressor, which will eventually turn on that has side chain. So here, you see that I have the sidechain set to kick, snare, key, left. Where is this coming from? If we go look at our tracks. So this feed is taking all of these tracks, which are all of the drums, all of the samples for kicks and snares. So the feed again is coming from here from this stuff. So that's your left hand. That's the signal that's gonna tell your right hand what to do. Exactly. This again that we have in solo and here we see the feed. I'm setting this to unity gain. And then when I come here to my instance of neutron on the bass, I set it to listen to it as we just said a minute ago. And then when I have my compressor, we're gonna set the side chain, but let's go to this transient shaper first. I am wanting to put the final touches on this bass. So I have my fixing is done, my big sculpting is done. Now it's really polishing it in there. Transient shaper, why? I just wanted to pop a little harder, so. So the attack, a little bit, sustain, tiny little bit. I'm setting it on sharp. You guys go play with this stuff. A little could go a long way. Don't be afraid of it. Exaggerate if need be here. Let's just listen to how those do bop. That's really what I want. So with that there, then I'm setting up a last compressor. Why? Yes, I want a little bit more clarity from the kick. So what we have is two elements that carry considerable amount of low end happening at the same time. The energy and the efficiency of the speaker trying to reproduce this is not as efficient as if it would just show one of them at a time. So we could think of, and here this is get a, a little heady for you producers out there, is you could, I guess, have your quantized drums and have your quantized bass as I have, and then move the bass back by, let's say, 12 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. We won't be quite able to hear those 12 milliseconds, but we will, in a, in a temporal plane, 
be getting one out of the way. So those transients will not line up. But we could also try to do something similar with a dynamic approach. The thing about the dynamic approach is that it's going to change the envelope. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we've worked so hard to create an envelope that we like. Well, can we embrace the distortion that's about to happen and make it even cooler? So let's play with this a little bit. I am going to duplicate this instance of Neutron in case I completely kill it. And I'm going to exaggerate this a lot by hitting play. And I am going to make the threshold so that we really hear the effect. And I'm going to turn up the makeup a lot so we can hear what it's doing so that then we can assess where we should put the attack in the release. So we see here, because of what I've set, that the attack, which is pretty fast, is getting out of the way when the kick happens. But then this release, I'm setting the release so that that pump that you hear makes the track groovier. Let's mess with this mm -hmm. and see how the groove starts to go away. If I make it faster, if I make it longer, So I'm dialing and I can see the envelope change, but the so chances are we would actually discover that the release time you set has some relationship to the tempo, right? Totally. And the quarter notes. Totally. Yeah. So this now is getting the bass out of the kick drum, but it's also adding this nice little pump to the entire track. Let's go and listen to the one that is not totally mangled. And of course, it's going to be a, a little bit more subtle than the other one. But let's hear not so much the bass, but rather the clarity of the kick. And yeah, the overall just bounce of the track. So here is without. As we do this second listen, the kick drum without this sidechain compressor sounds gummier to me. That's the adjective that is coming. It's like this kind of molassier gummier and the other one just the snap is a little bit harder. So let's check it out. So all the kids are doing it, which is cool, but to to understand why and what are your options and how this tip and trick could really be mangling your audio or it could be providing a lot of good. So, so I want to take us back to two ideas that stand a little bit in contrast to each other. So the, the first one is EQing before compression yeah. in order to change the signal that the compressor is affecting. Mm -hmm. And then there's changing the side chain. Any quick thoughts about when you would use one approach versus another, just to kind of tie a bow on that topic? To me, it always starts before I put anything on is what am I trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. So if the thing that I'm trying to achieve is I want the shortest of slivers of the attack of the kick drum to come out, I might not do what I just did, which is put almost all of the, the samples in. I might grab one, the main sample, EQ it so that it's just a not send it to the mix and have that feed the compressor. It's going to be considerably more efficient. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of thinking almost like a, a de-esser mm -hmm. in, in some way. Right. So right. this is my process in short. What do I want to achieve? I hear it in my head. Good. Make the best educated guess. Within what I know, I think this is going to get me there, not the fastest, but the most efficiently. Great. Try it. And then I'm very honest about, am I realizing it or not? 
Not quite. Cool. Give yourself a little bit of time to stretch the rubber band. That doesn't work. Plan B. And be agile about it. So that plan B might be you need to go and EQ the side chain, et cetera, the feed to the side chain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Nice. Can I just leave people with a encouraging yet hard to hear realization? I just want to make a confession about compression yes. and me. I've been doing this for more than a little bit. It seems like the cycle is about every four years. Oh, I understand what compression can do. Got it. Then I go to bed and I wake up and I try it again and go, oh no. <laughs> and it also can do this and it changes the, and it's in, I haven't fully understood what compression can do. And, and it's, uh, if I'm on a bad day, it's a bit of a bummer, but most days it's a fun thing to go and see because it's, uh, it's, it's voodoo stuff. But the more that I understand how to interact with this wizardry, the cooler things I make. So don't get discouraged. It is not easy. Mixing is hard, but there you go. Hopefully this will help you lead the way a little bit better. Thanks.